Who expected Saul's conversion? No one. No one saw this coming. This is the last thing that those who know Saul expect in this moment. Saul, in many ways, was the least likely person in the world to be converted. And yet what we discover here is that our God is a God who delights to save impossible people. He delights to it. This is his glory, to save impossible people. I was reminded of a story that I read of a man named Tom Papinia. Uh, Papinia grew up as a, as a thief, as an extortionist. He later became involved in the mafia. Uh, he was abused by his father uh, as a boy. And at the age of 10, he vowed he would never shed another tear. So he became a cold man, a man who was feared by criminals. And God began pursuing this man. And he began to experience guilt in his soul that weighed on him for all the wrong things that he had done in life. But, but as he began to feel guilty, he felt that he was without hope, that there was no chance for him, that he was, he was even beyond the hope of God being able to help him in any way. And so he, he actually decided that, that he would take his life. And as he was contemplating through this, the phone rings and it is an old friend of his who invites him to church. He thinks, what would be the point of going to church? But he decides to do it to prove God wrong, to show how far he is beyond God's help. I'll do it and I'll show God that this was a worthless waste of time. And so he does it, he goes to church. And after the service, the pastor greets him at the door. And this is what the pastor said. He said, I don't want to offend you, but I want to share something with you. Uh, the eyes are a window of the soul. And when I first looked into your eyes today, all I could see was a little boy crying, wanting to be loved. It's not exactly the sort of thing that you would share with someone if you knew they were involved in the mafia. <laughs> Probably, he didn't, he didn't know that. And so he shares this, and it had an effect on, on Papinia where he felt like this guy's reading his cards, like this guy knows about him. This was his, this was his deepest secret from his from his childhood and these emotions that he was experiencing. And he, he couldn't live with the thought of someone else knowing this, this about him. And so he resolved, in fact, that later that day, he was going to go take care of this pastor. He's going to go kill the guy. So he sets up an appointment and, and meets with the pastor. He takes a gun there. And when he gets there, uh, he finds himself unable to go through with it. He and the pastor are talking. He's, the pastor is calling him to repentance, calling him to Christ, no matter how much he has sinned, no matter where he is at. And, and he said, Pastor, if the people in your church realize who I am, what I've done, uh, I'm probably the biggest sinner you would encounter in a million years and these people don't want me I'm too great a sinner and he went on to share just to begin to share some of the crimes that he had done and before he knew it there he was on his knees on the ground weeping for the first time in decades confessing his sins to God and welcoming Jesus Christ as his savior a sinner saved from wrath through Christ's death and a life completely changed by the power of the risen Christ and by the transforming power of God's grace. God delights to save impossible people. And Saul is the great illustration of this truth. You have people in your life, you think, you just can't imagine that person being saved. Don't put them in the category of being beyond the reach of God's grace. Our God is a God who delights to save impossible people. And there is no one that is beyond the reach of his grace. And God is continuing to reveal Christ today. Just as Christ was revealed to Saul on that day, God is in the business of opening blind eyes to see the glory of Christ. Maybe you come here today and, you, and you're not into the Christianity thing or maybe you're just on the outskirts of the church and you don't get why people are so excited about Jesus. The issue in all of that, if you don't understand Christianity, has to do with how you view Jesus and who Jesus is. Conversion, becoming a Christian, is when our eyes are opened up to see Jesus for who he really is. We come to know him as he is. And conversion, becoming a Christian, is 
is entirely an act of God. When you think of Christian conversion, when you think of your own conversion, Christian conversion is not us making a decision for God. Saul does not look back on his experience and think, boy, I made a really good decision there on the road to Damascus. It's not what this, what this was about. Saul was not prepared for this. Saul was not seeking God. Saul brought nothing to his conversion but his own sin and blindness and hard-heartedness. And it was God who pursued him in Christ. And that would forever shape the way that, that Paul would tell his story. His would be a story of divine initiative. And friends, yours is a story of divine initiative as well. The way that Paul would put it, Philippians 3 verse 12, is that he was apprehended by Christ. He was taken hold of by the living Jesus. Christ Jesus has made me his own. And brothers and sisters, your conversion is no less the result of divine initiative. Those of you who are saved today, how have you come to be saved? It has been the work of God. He sought you out. He pursued you in his grace. And every Christian can sing with the hymn writer, my Lord, I did not choose you. That could never be. My heart would still refuse you had you not chosen me. And this is what ultimately explains then the joy and the gratitude that would characterize all of Paul's life and all of Paul's letters. Paul's a man who wrote much of the New Testament. The whole second half of Acts focuses in on this man. He never forgot what he once was. He never forgot what he was in those days and he never stopped marveling at the mercy that God had showed him. So he says in 1 Timothy 1, Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. He remembers what he was. Do you remember what you once were? Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord Jesus overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. This would forever be his outlook on his life. Foremost of sinners, saved how? Only by the mercy of Christ. Only by the mercy that God had shown him in our Savior. Is that your outlook today? Is that your story? Grace abounding to the foremost of sinners. Friends, we should spend our lives marveling at the grace that God has shown us in saving sinners like us.